and marriage, love and marriage Go together like a horse and carriage This I tell you, brother You can't have one without the other Love and marriage, love and marriage It's an institute you can't disparage Ask the local gentry and they will say it's elementary well love and marriage but there's also something called divorce right so welcome to strictly legal on wesn content capital my name is rondel donoa attorney at law and i'll be your host today for divorce 101 the basics with me in studio of course while we may have a union, we also have something called divorce. So with me, I have a special guest, Mr. Justin Junke, who is an attorney at law by profession. He's also a former independent, he told me to stress, independent senator um, in the last how much ever parliaments, uh, as well as he is the head of Lex Fortis Chambers in Port of Spain. And he will be speaking to us about the basics of divorce. What is divorce? How do you get about um, obtaining a divorce? As well as pertinent information that one may want to know. So, Justin, good day. Good day, Mr. Donovan. How are you? I am well. I am well. I, oh, how I, was the introduction? I must say I admire <laughs> your choice in music. I, I, now I'm waiting with bated breath at every single intro you ever have because you chose <laughs> the perfect one for this morning's proceedings. Of course, because a lot of persons think that, you know, I mean, while you take a vow till death do us part, sometimes it's not always like that, right? Absolutely. So let's get into divorce. I mean, well, what is the layman explanation of a divorce? Now, party's done. That's literally what the layman will say. Husband and wife have decided to separate because, as I say to a lot of my clients, it's better to be happy apart than miserable together. You know, so a divorce mm. is the ending of a relationship between parties that have previously been recognized in law. Now, one would say that the law typically mirrors, I guess, religious scriptures. Yes. You would have some religions that say thou shalt not kill their laws against death, uh, against killing. You'd say thou shalt not steal their laws against stealing. Now, in thou shalt not divorce. Well, you see, in that regard, it appears that the law seeks to preserve the institution of marriage. So when the parties come before God or before whomever they worship and before man, there are both moral and contractual obligations that arise. Yes. And if you get into a contract in the ordinary sense, and that contract needs to be terminated for whatever reason. You have to satisfy the court and each other that it should come to an end. And divorce is the same thing because certain rights and responsibilities arise yes. when the parties get married. So the law seeks to preserve the institution and only in instances where the parties can prove to the court that this is a union that should be separated and like, just like a, a contract, then the court will pronounce that you can go your separate ways legally. And one may ask, okay, what are the grounds for divorce? Because a lot of persons have this misconception that there are numerous grounds. And of course, in law, we have what we call the ground, and then we have the facts. So explain to the public the ground or grounds of a divorce. Now, not just the public, <laughs> but more importantly, my former students at the Hewitting Law School and, and sure, young practicing I'm attorneys. I'm sure they're actually listening because you have a few um, Hewitting students who, who do pay attention. Please, <laughs> before you invite the ire of the court, there is one ground for divorce. Students, one ground. And that is that the marriage has broken down irretrievably. Now, in order to establish that ground, you must prove one or more of five facts. I'm not going to bore, I mean, the students will know it and the, 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 you know, the, the, the participants in the divorce, the litigants don't need to actually know it. There are five facts on which you can rely. And, and let's go through the facts. Now, 
in terms of divorces, the first thing you hear people talk about is adultery. Mm. And so I'll start with that first. That's commonplace, so hey. it, Well, I wouldn't say so. And in some instances, I'm not even sure if that is the fact you should rely. Right. But the first and the most common is adultery. And it would be that one party has had a sexual relationship with someone who is not a party to the marriage. Now, yes, persons may come to realize that this may have happened, but the threshold that one would have to meet to prove that fact mm -hmm. is a bit onerous. For instance, you'd have to mention the name of the person with whom your yeah. spouse has had that illicit relationship. And then you'd have to name that person as a correspondent. So then one asks, what if you don't know the name of the other person? Or what if there are more, there's more than one person? And when we say correspondence, we mean that that person has to be in the divorce document or the petition. Correct. So I should track back to say yeah. that the person who is applying for the divorce is called the petitioner. And the person against whom the allegation is being made, in this case adultery, is called the respondent. It would then mean that the person with whom they had the adulterous relationship is called the correspondent. Or if you have proof that there's more than one, the correspondence, plural. Right. So it's right. Like, for instance, if you have Shelley and then Kim come in the picture. Mm-hmm. Right? It's funny and you mentioned Kim. The there's a Kim. famous Kim who is um <laughs> who's filing for divorce. Oh, right. From Kanye. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, so uh, I ideally you would want to avoid the angst and the public embarrassment and the agnominy that comes with going through a very public bitter battle about adultery. Yeah. So what comes to the rescue, especially if parties can't meet the threshold to prove the illicit affair between the parties, because of course it may more than likely be denied, yes. there is another route. The other fact on which you can rely is on reasonable behavior. Now that's a, a common short. fact. It, and it's yes. the preferred fact in yes. my respectful opinion. It is that this person has behaved in such a way that I cannot reasonably continue to be expected to live with that person. And it catches all because you may see persons in the corner of the bedroom on a text, on a phone, beating away at the, 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 the keypad or coming home at all hours or inexplicable absences, or marks on your, you know, your shirt collar, inexplicable. I hope the camera picks up that mine has no marks. <laughs> so, or communication issues. There may be, yeah. well, so, so <laughs> what I'm saying, the reason I mentioned those first is that it may capture what adultery may not capture, but it yes. may also lead to instances, the unfortunate instance of abuse, yes. or neglect, or lack of communication, or differences in outlook in life parties no longer feeling the love that they once felt. And so unreasonable behavior is what usually emanates when parties don't get along. And it is a fact on which you can rely to establish that the marriage has broken down irretrievably. Yes. Now there, as a third one, that to me is a favorite, if the circumstances do exist. And it is that the parties have lived separate and apart for a period of two years, and the other party has consented to the divorce. Now, separate and apart, I want to get to that. Yes. Case. Because it is possible to live separate and apart as man and wife, but it doesn't mean that you have to live outside of the house. House. You can live it in just, separate bedrooms. You could live in the oh. For socioeconomic reasons, you may be constrained to move out. You may be like, look, we, this family cannot afford two households. We have children and so on. And they may elect to stay in the same house. But if one party does not treat the other party as their spouse, and I'm trying to be gender neutral, so I'm not assigning rules as to who should cook, who should clean, who should take care of whom. So I'm using the term spouse. If it is... You live in the same house, but you sleep in separate rooms. You don't share birthdays. You don't share anniversaries. You don't celebrate these things together. You don't go to church together. And you don't have you don't share meals. relations. You don't have relations. Then it would be best, especially for the children, if you would just agree to separate. Because as I said before, it is better if yeah. you are happy alone than miserable together. Actually, especially someone for the that. sake of the children. Yeah. 
yeah. someone posted that when I said divorce is a taboo, and they said, well, it's not really a taboo, it's a taboo when you're unhappy in a marriage. <laughs> now, you know, statistics have proven that children get over a divorce within two years, but the lasting effects of living in an unhappy household far exceed that two-year mark. And I think persons who elect to stay together for the sake of the children may not understand the irreparable harm they're doing to those children. And how we raise our children is how we're preparing our society's future. Yes. And if it is we decide that we're staying together and you, you end up resenting the child a bit more when that child becomes a disappointment because then you're like, I stayed here for you and you have not lived up to my expectation. But what parents don't understand is that children resent the parents more oh. for raising them in an unhappy relationship. Now, I know this is strictly legal. I know mm -hmm. that's the name of the program. But of and I know people want to hear law. <laughs> but in as much as the program is strictly legal, divorce is somewhat Psycho emotional, emotional and, and psychological. psychological. Particularly so for attorneys as well who have to, to play the dual role of legal counsel and oh, yeah. Oh yeah, Ronald, Counselor. <laughs> listen, I empathize with criminal defense attorneys who have to appeal to their clients who use a gun, a cutlass, an ice pick as a weapon, as they accused. But for family lawyers who have to deal with persons who would use their children as yes. a weapon, that is where a lot of emotional intelligence and psychological understanding and empathy comes in. And that is why family law is a practice on its own. Yes. And it stands on its own. And I think if the judiciary pays more particular attention to how it treats the family court, then we would find that there's an effect on the rest of society. And kudos to the, uh, the, 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 the judiciary because a lot of time, effort, and resources have been spent mm -hmm. behind developing the family law court and the children's court, mm -hmm. which is a specialist court for children. Yes. And, and then there's the advent of uh, child advocates, which is not new, but mm -hmm. which is coming into prominence, so that children have a voice of their own. Yes. And, and let's go on to the fourth, the fourth fact, because I know we be, be so on yes. adultery, unreasonable behavior, mm -hmm. two years separation, that's well, with consent. Correct. Yeah. So you have to get the other party to sign. And then if you and your spouse have lived separate and apart for a continuous period of five years, then you can get a divorce. The difference is that there's no need for consent. Because in those instances, you find more often than not that the parties don't even know where their significant other lives. Yeah. Even in a small place like Trinidad, I've had instances where we could not, just could not find the other person. And then what's your alternative um, in terms of getting that relief um, if you can't find uh, your spouse separated for more than five years? I love your segues. <laughs> the reality is the law requires that if you file a petition, you can't divorce someone behind their back. <laughs> you may commit adultery behind their back, <laughs> but the divorce must be plainly known to them. And when you file your petition, it must be personally served on that person. Yes. You've asked what happens if you cannot find that person. It doesn't mean you cannot get divorced and you remain married to a stranger in perpetuity. What happens, you make an application to the court that you would like to dispense with personal service, and you would like to get an order of the court for substituted service. Substituted service is an alternative means of finding the person and serving them the papers. It may not mean that they actually have the papers in their hand, but efforts must be made that are reasonable that it will have come to their attention. And for instance, you can have service by courier, by registered post, by advertising right. it, by serving it on a relative with whom the respondent is in contact with, that it can reasonably be expected that it will come to their attention. And now you can serve via social media. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not certain. I, I have not actually I, 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 had such an order. I, I've seen but service. I won't doubt. I've seen an order um, of, uh, of, of an honorable judge by service mm -hmm. of um, Facebook. By, but this was in a civil matter. Yes. Not a family matter. But it was, I mean, I, I was quite um, stunned when I saw the advertisement on Facebook with the order stating that well, you can serve via Facebook. Times must move with the technology. Yes. And I am happy to say that the judiciary has moved, it is, they've moved by leaps and bounds Indeed. to accommodate the difficulties brought on by the pandemic Thanks. to continue the course of justice. And if by social media, that is how people communicate. Yes. People sell them, look at their television. People use their television to play games and they use their computers to watch television. 
And the fifth, and the fifth fact. Let's the fifth fact, quickly. quite mm. simply, that they have deserted you for a period of two years. You've not seen that person, you've not heard of that person, they're gone. Just as we may be in a couple of seconds for a <laughs> short while. Justin, we have to take a break. We'll be right back. You're watching WESN Content Capital. And welcome back. You are watching Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. With me, attorney at law, Justin John Clear. Right, so what's the legal procedure for filing a divorce petition? Um, just run us through the steps from, from consultation filing to hearing. All right, so first of all, in order to file a divorce, you need to have your certificate of marriage. Persons will wonder, well, why do I need a certificate of marriage? And if so, why the original? Because you do need the original. Yes. I mean, I usually tell my clients, well, look, if you're getting a divorce, the least important document in your cabinet will be your certificate of marriage yep. because you're no longer using it because you're no longer married. Yep. You have to present that together with any other supporting documents, such as uh, information relating to your children, if you have or any information relating to proceedings that are in the courts at the time relating to either the children or property settlement, or if there are issues such as applications for protection orders under the Domestic Violence Act. And of course so the children has to be children of the family. Correct. So that you also have to file, if there are children, a statement of arrangements for children. Because the court, people think the court cares about them and their issues. And I'm not saying the court doesn't. But the court has a larger obligation to the children of the family. So that if there are children in the household, the court wants to know if the respondent or the petitioner has a continuing obligation to them. And if so, what it is. What are the children's arrangements now for schooling, for, ed you know, for education, for yes. medical, for those things. And how those children will be cared for and maintained in the future. So you have to set those things out and it has to be to the court's satisfaction. Otherwise, the divorce cannot go through unless the court is satisfied either that the, the, the arrangements for the children are the best that could be devised in these circumstances or that they are satisfied that they are good for the children's just, general welfare. Justin, before you continue, now children of the family, a lot of persons have the idea that children means biological children mm -hmm. of the, both the petitioner and respondent. Is there an instance where... Um, one child is not a biological child of, of either party, however, they are being maintained by the, the petitioner or the respondent? Absolutely, yes. Now, you may come into a marriage with a child. That child, and of course I'm being gender neutral, that child may have grown to become dependent financially on the maintenance that is provided by both parties. And if that came from one breadwinner, even if that is the person who is going to be filing the petition to end the marriage, that petitioner retains an obligation to that child to the extent that they previously accepted and adopted the responsibility for that child's welfare. And it even extends to children who are above the age of majority but who still are involved in tertiary level education. And it is simply because the court wants to preserve, if not the institution mm -hmm. of marriage, mm -hmm. the welfare of the child. Mm -hmm. So that you don't want to have a child undone by because the parents or the, if not the parents, the parties couldn't get along. Mm. Yeah. The child not, must not be disadvantaged. Yes. And the court also equally looks at the prejudice that may be caused to the financially weaker party in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So that if a spouse wants to separate but they are the income earner, and by separating and splitting the household, it leaves the other spouse, with or without children, in a weaker financial position. The court has to consider what will happen to that person because without that, that person yeah. becomes a burden on the yeah. state uh, on, uh, and becomes a welfare person, uh, you know, a welfare litigant. Yeah. And because of that, the court wants to ensure that the parties are in the best position they could possibly be, or at least in no worse a position than they will have been during the course of the marriage. No. I know we are in the procedure in terms of filing a divorce, but can one get married today and file for a divorce tomorrow? 
well, technically you can file, but <laughs> it will not be accepted. The reality is the one constraint is that you must be married for a year before you can file for a divorce. Yes. Unfortunately, however, some persons live in situations where they suffer abuse or there's significant prejudice that would be caused to them if they were forced to remain in a marriage so they can file a special application to ask the courts to waive that requirement mm -hmm. so that they don't they no longer need to yes. be married or tethered to that person in those unfortunate circumstances. And that's a different circumstance for another day. Correct. So we've drafted the divorce. What's next? Well you the say petition. you say we. No, <laughs> the, 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 the challenges are some persons do not fall within the socioeconomic bracket that they can afford the traditional services of an attorney at law to file. So I think it will be useful to the viewers to know that if your income is below a certain amount, you can apply through the Legal Aid and Advisory Authority for representation and have that attorney who is more experienced in the manner of filing divorces and that they will take the matter for you. If, however, you earn an amount above that threshold, let's say the threshold is $7,000, but you still find that your disposable income does not predispose you to hiring a lawyer in a traditional sense, then you can go to the Hewitting Law School's Legal Aid Clinic where I used to yes. teach and work, and they, for a significantly lower fee, will handle your divorce for you. I mean, it's fair to say that you can file a petition for divorce on your own, but it's pretty much like you can cut your hair on your own. On your own, yes. And you that you can, can do it, but will you be pleased with your <laughs> results? I'm certain there's somebody to, you know, to whom you like to give credit for your very fresh cut. Of course. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right, so, so we filed the divorce petition. Well, now the divorce petition is filed, and that's filed in the... It's in the family, family court, court, but if you want to file in San Fernando or Tobago, in the sub-registries, you can. I know we of don't have those much are old time. rules. <laughs> Correct, but um, the ideal place would be the family court, but yes. if circumstances do not permit, then San Fernando and Tobago also accept petitions, but it will be under the old rules. I know that we have a lot more to cover, yes. and we may not be able to cover it today given the time, but I'm happy if sure. you will have me back. Def no, def definitely, because what, 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 what I want also to, um, for the viewers to note, at least you can state, um, what is expected when you file a petition for divorce? When you file a petition, you will eventually get the uh, get it served, you'll get a date to appear in court within about eight weeks. Once you get to the court and there are no issues surrounding children or property settlement, you can simply get what is called a decree nisi. That is the first stage of a divorce. That will be made absolute upon the expiry of six weeks. And unless, of course, you file an application where you would like it to be truncated for highly prejudicial, you know, if there are issues that would preclude you from waiting that six weeks. But uh, ultimately, you do want to go before the court with your documents so that it only lasts one day, and hopefully you can negotiate or you can be, you know, deal with the other party with compassion, with empathy, with understanding, so that it will be a successful divorce. And sometimes divorce petitions only last within five minutes. It could, <laughs> it could, it could, especially with the help of an attorney. Yes. And um, before we wrap up, now, a question was asked, if, if I am living abroad, no, I, I got married I, in Trinidad I, 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 I need to apologize. Yes. The application that you make in relation to shortening the time applies to the six weeks and not the one year one that year. I had mentioned okay. previously. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. yes. um, with respect to me being married, so I'm married, I, I, I well, solemnized in Trinidad and Tobago, I went abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens? Um, can I file for divorce petition abroad? No. Only the person, on one of the parties, at least one of the parties, must be domiciled in Trinidad and Tobago, meaning living here living. for a period of a year immediately preceding the petition. So if you were to go away, but your spouse remained in Trinidad, then yes, you can still apply. But if your marriage certificate, your certificate of marriage is from abroad, you would have to get that. And of course, if you are signing your petition and you can't get into the country in COVID-19 conditions and so on, and you don't have the respondent who will then step into the shoes of the petitioner, then you'll have to have your documents notarized and sent to Trinidad and file on your behalf. And then file. Correct. Justin, it was really, really good having you. There's so much things to, to speak about divorce. We haven't even this touched on custody. You know, whereas joint custody, 
If you could just touch quickly on joint custody. Quickly speaking, joint custody only applies to married persons. If you are not married, only one party will be vested with custody, care, and control of the child. And the other, access. Access, care, and control. Now, that's an entirely different, different. topic and an entirely different. And then thing. we have property settlement as well. <laughs> Which is about weeks and so, weeks. So I have two more sessions with you. Right, and I'm sure the public was grateful for your knowledge and expertise in terms of family law practice because that is something that is needed um, in this jurisdiction. So, guys, it's a wrap. You've been watching Strictly Legal with myself, Rhonda Donoa. I thank my guest, the Honorable Mr. Justin Junkier. <laughs> Reviewing once again next week, Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. I'm out. Have a good day.